thanks for everyone for uh, coming here today. We <clears throat> want to uh, definitely talk a lot, a lot about um, Nick and his, his background and his views on a number of different topics, um, you know, chiefly you know, the gene therapy space and, and his efforts at Bluebird. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is also open up uh, questions maybe a little earlier on after we talk about a few, um, a few key items that we'd like, like to hit on before we do that. But we'd love to ha have this to be more uh, interactive than less uh, so that we can address uh, any lingering questions out there. Um, but yeah, this is Nick uh, Lashley, uh, Chief Bluebird at, at Bluebird Bio. Uh, as many of you know, you know Bluebird is uh, roughly a billion dollar market cap and is on the a forefront of uh, gene therapy and um, in that space uh, and is doing a lot of exciting things. Um, and you know, I think Nick is uh, a great spokesman for uh, not only that space, but I think a lot of the, the recent IPO, um, IPO companies that have gone out and can speak to uh, some of his personal experiences, uh, perhaps some lessons learned there to the, to the extent that's useful for, for those of you in the audience. Um, but Nick, you know, I, I'd like to um, turn, turn it over to you at this point. I, I'd love to uh, maybe have you share some of your background. You, you came from, uh, from a very uh, you know, successful background, both uh, you know, Third Rock and the venture community, as well as Millennium. Uh, and so you know, coming from, from that perch, uh, no pun intended, um, <laughs> maybe a little. Um, but, but coming from there and, and deciding to uh, really uh, jump uh, with both feet into um, a, a burgeoning space, but a space, you know, like a lot of different um, new therapeutic modalities has faced challenges in the past. Uh, love, to, love to hear your thoughts on really the, the thought process and, um, you know, your experiences that really yep. led up to, to finding you to where you are today. All right. Well, first, thank you, Chris, for having me, and appreciate you taking time, and for everyone showing up. And I too would encourage this to be as interactive as possible, so I'm not just sort of droning on. Um, but I can give you a little background on on my background, as well, also Bluebird and, and what we're about. Um, I'll go way back. I was born in Denmark. I immigrated in 19. Uh, 79 on August 3rd to Princeton, showed up, couldn't speak English, uh, nor could my three older brothers. And that sort of uh, set our trajectory in, in sort of what we believe in and grounding in family. And the reason I'll share that bit is that has been a consistent theme and is actually why I, I made the decision to move from various companies and ultimately come to Bluebird because of the, the potential I think we have there to make a big difference specifically in the lives of, uh, of children. And having been blessed with five daughters, which is maybe a blessing today, but they're only oldest are 14, so we'll have to see if I consider that a blessing five years from now. But right now, it is a blessing in the sense I've been very fortunate with uh, happy, for the most part, and healthy, certainly kids. And again, that ties back into why I made the jump into uh, gene therapy. But also having been grown up in a family full of, of healthcare, uh, mom being a dentist, dad being a pharmacist, and being witnessing part of the pharma space growing up sort of explains why I really like the biotech space. Uh, now that's a, a personal angle on that, just a smaller company that is driven by success because if they don't succeed at what they do, they go out of business. So again, these are a couple of different angles that might explain why I've gotten into a smaller uh, sort of startup environment uh, for my personal interest. Um, one last thing is I'm a, I consider myself a wannabe scientist. I did study uh, Princeton and Molecular Biology with Arnie Levine, who's a well-known, uh, one of the, the founders founders of P53, one of the things he told me after my about to do my thesis, he suggested strongly that I get out of science. And I, 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 uh, I've often thought back on that. He said it nicely, but I think he meant it uh, partly because I probably was not meant for the lab. And I wasn't particularly good in the lab, but I always loved that intersection between science and business. And so that's where I have, have lived. I work with PhDs and I married an MD. So that was sort of as, as close as I could, could get to those actual degrees and then I settled for, for an MBA. So th that's, those are a little bit of some personal aspects that may explain why I was fortunate to work at Millennium Pharmaceuticals for six, seven years working with Velcade, a very important product for multiple myeloma, and fortunate in the sense that that started to teach you the impact of what our industry can do. It also taught us how horribly bad we are at IR, generally speaking, and communicating the power of what we do as an industry. 
But be that as it may, that's where I got to know the folks who helped start Third Rock in 2007 with the idea of building companies that are transformational in nature. Go back to old school venture capital and say, how do you do fewer companies, spend more time and energy in that? Because I would be first to admit, I actually think I'm a terrible investor. And so whether personally or professionally, but what I love to do is get into companies in a more tactile sense and really help to operate. And so when we helped found Third Rock, that was the idea, was go out into companies serially and then come back in. And so the first company was one called Agios Pharmaceuticals, which is a cancer and metabolism company that's also recently gone public. It was in their first eight months, came back to Third Rock, did one more company and then back, and now the third one was Bluebird. And I have to say, I grew up around a family table where gene therapy was almost a bad word. Small molecule, biologic, why would you ever, gene therapy is just not going to work. It's a dream, it's a pipe dream, etc. And I think we were not looking for it at Third Rock either. We were looking for transformational opportunities in rare genetic diseases. And that's where the story began for us, which is we saw adrenal leukodystrophy, or ALD, which is this terrible brain disorder for kids, where you just see this catastrophic decline, but you have the potential to cure these kids with a transplant-based gene therapy. And that was what captures our imagination, was that data, and the beginning of that data on another terrible disease called thalassemia. When you look at that, then all of a sudden we said, well, let's dig into this gene therapy thing. And then the rest is, to some degree, history, and I can certainly get more into the gene therapy space, but just from a personal perspective, that was the march, and then the move from Third Rock to go full-time to Bluebird was very obvious. Uh, it took just a few months after starting that company saying that this converges all my personal interests. It's all about curing kids who have been handed a genetic death sentence in a completely unjustifiable way and the potential to do something that hadn't been done before with a team that, that I personally feel is, is pretty spectacular. So that was an exciting part. So it met all my personal interests dating from birth uh, through now and now we're having a boatload of fun trying to, to run at it. And I can certainly take it any angle you want. Sure. Um, and I don't want to make this a, a Bluebird infomercial. So uh, to the extent you guys have questions, we can dive that way as well. Well, I mean, <coughs> setting this stage, uh, approximately what year did you join Bluebird? 2010. Okay. So, uh, four plus years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say gene therapy really is um, coming to vogue probably the last couple of years. Yep. So, by, by really, you're certainly ahead of the curve, uh, when, it, when it, at least as it pertains to um, the general interest in this space. And I'd be interested just to hear your thoughts on, you know, some of the uh, uh, some of the issues that you know the technology had faced uh, going back to the '90s, right? With uh, the, obviously the UPenn experience yeah. and so forth. But <clears throat> but how did you get comfortable with that? And what did you see on the horizon? Maybe some others didn't. Um, whether it be some clinical data, you know, gene therapies yep. acceptance outside of the U.S., um, you know, was was the current environment environment really a reflection of an overreaction uh, by yep. regulatory authorities? Or, you know, I'd be interested to hear your thought process there. I, I think uh, when we were at Third Rock, the, the sort of the word we used was we we saw the gene therapy field as a bit of an arbitrage opportunity, in the sense that it has actually come in the last five, six, ten years remarkably far without anybody noticing it, because of those catastrophic events that occurred over a decade ago where they were using a different virus to do what they were doing. One of them was just sort of medical practice, less about gene therapy, but everyone remembers that. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that actually created a great investment opportunity because if you believe in the science and you believe in the clinical data that you're seeing for these patients, the fact that there are four kids with ALD who by all accounts should be dead or vegetative at this point are not, that's what gives you the reason to believe. And that was the premise for which at Third Rock we said, now's the time, but you got to go big. You got to, at the time, putting in $35 million in a Series A was somewhat unheard of. And so we said, well, let's, let's run at it. Worst case, we know ALD will be a product for rare genetic disease. We believe that. Best case, we actually could see a fundamental therapeutic platform here that if you get good at the fundamentals, but you got to invest in the fundamentals, then you can uh, go a long way. And I think what happened was, Gene therapy roughly breaks down into two major classes, if you will, on the viral side. If you're going to use something to actively put a piece of DNA or a gene into your DNA, you have to either use uh, what's called AAV, an adenovirus, which sort of goes into your cell type, but then it sits in the cytoplasm and expresses whatever piece of DNA you have, a non-integrating virus. Or you can use a lenti-based virus, like we do, 
where it not only goes into the cell, but it integrates a piece of DNA into that cell. So when that cell divides, it lives on. So that's more of a permanent con correction. So we're on the lenty side because the type of cell we go into, the hematopoietic stem cell, rapidly divides. And if you just are sitting in the cytoplasm, you'll lose your expression. You won't get any sort of functional fix. And so just remember that nature. But if you go back in history, that integrating virus that used to use a different kind of virus, one that actually, and this may get a little technical, I apologize, but it goes into places that are near promoter-rich regions. It goes in upstream of proliferative genes because each one of these viruses are guided by certain integrases. So they sit down on the DNA in certain areas. This one, the one that was used in the past, sat down in areas that were bad news and that was discovered over time. As opposed to, in a weird way, the Lenny virus, which is HIV-based, interestingly enough, actually doesn't sit down. It's much more promiscuous, if you will, and much more random. And as a result of that, you don't get that same sort of bad act approach to insert the piece of DNA. And that was what has been discovered and now been borne out in the clinic that technically got us very comfortable very quickly. People are still sort of trying to understand it because it is still a random insertion of a piece of DNA. But at the same time, that's what helped us technically get over it along with the clinical data. And we said, now let's run at it. But the last one was perhaps the biggest kicker. Nobody knew how to manufacture this virus. You're gonna manufacture it at scale. And in 2010, we could do one GMP run, one patient. And I don't know for those of you who've managed budgets with GMP runs, they generally get very expensive, right? So whether that's 500,000 or a million, you're in that category. That's not that doable, certainly not very scalable. So we've spent the last three, four years getting really good at making that virus because we're only as good at that virus is as inserting a piece of DNA. And that's been the big transition for us, sort of cracking that nut, if you will. And then you can start to believe in other indications, not only ALD, thalassemia, sickle cell, and oncology is a different but related application. And that's when we turn from a single product opportunity into a product platform. And that's what I think caught the imagination of, <laughs> of uh, well, a few investors and now hopefully more investors, not only in us, but in other gene therapy plans. Mm -hmm. And so it's, been, it's, it's gone faster and more positively than personally I could have imagined or certainly predicted. But, you know, not going to look a gift horse uh, in the mouth on that one. No, I, I think uh, I think you hit on an interesting point. I mean, certainly you saw the the scientific pro and even clinical progress, but really, uh, a question I had coming in today was, well, you know, how disruptive can gene therapy really be? And certainly, as part of that mm -hmm. thought process, you you certainly look at what has been done to date, but but you mentioned it just now. What other indications can this be useful um, in? And and I think. You know, I think it's interesting when you when you look at um, uh, s some of the recent companies that have gone out. Um, you know, whether uh, whether they're in retinal diseases or orphan diseases, those seem to be pretty uh, pretty fertile ground to develop uh, gene therapy products in. But but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on even going beyond. Those indications, uh, obviously, some companies are developing products in hemophilia, a massive yeah. uh, market. But you know, HIV, where do, where can it really go, and wh where where is the opportunity? You know, ten or, or so, or twenty years from now. I mean, I, I'm. Uh as my board calls me, I'm a pathological optimist. Uh, so in that sense, I, I can, I'll paint the big vision, but let me start with the sort of the belief that it's not gonna work everywhere. It's not the right tool for every kind of, of indication. Right now, it's, it's starting where it should, which is in where the risk benefit calculation is, is the right one. So you're willing to take more risk. But I think uh, if you get your head around, around that concept, it is, we're finally talking about fixes. Right? You're not talking about ameliorating a, a disease. You're not talking about sort of just dealing with the symptomatology. You're dealing with a genetic fix. So in the case of monogenic diseases, you know, you can go as far as your ability to go into whatever the target cell is and replace the gene, either cut and paste or just jam in new copies of a functional gene. So if you have an understanding of the genetics, it's somewhat endless where you can go. But that can all get trimmed back as it has with, okay, well, where are the more practical areas you can go into this? And some of those in the near term here have been pretty outstanding and, and pretty large. People used to think of gene therapy as just ALD-like, meaning very small genetic monogenic indications. You're not going to go past that. But I think pretty quickly, thalassemia and sickle cell are the most common genetic disorders in the world, bar none. 
And those are monogenic diseases. Those are a, a problem with your, with your globin, with your blood. So if you can figure out a way to insert enough copies of that, you can cure those diseases that are incredibly, well, not only lethal, but also you can imagine from a population basis, you can have a huge impact. Just give you a, a small little chance, a small example. Thalassemia, where you can't produce enough hemoglobin, you need transfusions to stay alive a majority of the time. So if you don't get those transfusions, the average age of death is seven years old. And so where you are getting transfusions, the, the downside of that is those transfusions build up iron. That iron takes you into organ failure, and on average you'll die anywhere between the ages of four, 40 to 60, depending on where you are, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger. So not a great quality of life along the way, because you're getting chelated every night, and you're getting transfused. And so here's an idea where we've taken a patient, treated them one time with our therapy. Within 10 days, in this case, 12 days in the other patient, they stopped requiring transfusions. Despite having depended on those transfusions since the age of two, now at the age of you know, 16 to 20 years old, all of a sudden, no more transfusions. It means no more buildup of iron. It means the potential for you to have a, a long and fruitful life with a high quality of life and a longer life is that much better. So that, the, just that notion gives me goosebumps saying, boy, if you can do that, that is a really amazing improvement in the healthcare. Take Thailand. 40% of their banked blood goes to treating transfusions for thalassemia. 40%. So that is a national health epidemic in that country. And that's very hard to deal with. But what if you could take each of these patients' own cells, insert a functioning copy, and give it back to them, which is what we do, you can have a dramatic effect on that disease. And you can do the same thought process with sickle cell. Others are working on with AAV, the other kind of vector that I uh, described to you, in hemophilia, right? What if you can do a one-time treatment, create enough sustained expression of factor to actually cure that disease? I mean, the impact on that is, uh, these are just the easy ones, if you will. These are the ones that are clearly monogenic, that have huge implications uh, on, a, on a global basis and also certainly in the U.S. and, and Europe. And so and then you can start thinking, well, that's just kind of the, we call it the HSC, the hematopoietic stem cell side of the equation, where you're affecting either expression of a fact or others. But the, what's really exploded uh, a little, to my personal surprise, but I'm happy about it, is if we take out your bone marrow, we can isolate your blood stem cell, and that's what we've been doing. We hijack that cell and we fix it, so it just keeps on giving. The other thing you can do is take the T cell. So get rid of the metabolic stem cells, just take out your mature T cell. And that is certainly the basis for a lot of the immunotherapy programs that are out there now. This is where all the words you've heard about CARs, chimeric antigen receptors, because you hijack that T cell, you use a virus to infect that T cell and put a sort of inorganic, if you will, engineered receptor that then targets it to a tumor. So that field has taken off. That's the Junos, the Kites, the Novartises, the us and cell genes are running at that. But that doesn't stop there. You can engineer a chimeric antigen receptor. You can also take a T cell receptor and say, let's stick a T cell receptor on that, which is specific to certain maybe intracellular uh, sort of um, proteins that are expressed on uh, your, your presenting cells. That also is very powerful. That also requires uh, use of a, of a virus of sorts to do that. So you can start to expand that. And then last but not least, we chose to get into the editing side of the equation, genome editing. And you can say, well, why'd you do that? You're a lentivirus company. No, we're a gene therapy company. And gene therapy means manipulation of your DNA. And at certain points, it may make sense to do what we've done, which is take a lentivirus, which is a delivery tool. It packages a gene, sticks it into a piece of DNA. That may not be enough. You may want to take an editing tool, a nuclease, stick it in that same cell and shut down or cut that DNA in an area that shuts down a protein or expression of some other sort. So you're doing two things at once to the same cell. That's, that's all manipulation around the DNA. So it's those types of things that we're thinking about because lo and behold, disease is fairly complicated genetically and otherwise. And so we think having access to those types of tools. So that's where the explosion starts to kind of add up and the convergence. And that's what I don't think a lot of people are seeing. They're seeing cars, they're seeing genome editing, they're seeing gene therapy. What we see is one sort of set of capabilities to go after a slew of diseases, and others are starting to come to that same uh, approach. We're not fans of pure plays, because it doesn't give you enough mm -hmm. optionality. Um, that's the Bluebird version of that, but and we also need 50 products. So that's what I think you're going to see more and more of, and the big boys are starting to pay for that and get engaged. Well, I mean, certainly we've uh, talked, well, you've talked about, you know, a lot of the, the benefits and potential 
uh, of gene therapy and, and the different approaches uh, that, you, that you just went through. Um, but I'd be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on some of the current limitations now and, and w whether, whether they're um, you know, temporary or, or even uh, potentially longer, uh, you know, longer, bigger issues. Um, but maybe, maybe we can start you know, kind of on the you know, technical side but th and then talk more about other, other areas, pricing, reimbursement, regulatory. But, but just from a, more of a technical basis, you know, what are some limitations you're seeing? What keeps you up at night? Um, you know, when you when you have your, you know, whether it's the, your lead program in, in phase three or, or other mm -hmm. programs you're developing, be interested to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, it's my kids that keep me up at night. Uh, I think that's way, <laughs> that's way, you know, having three teenagers in that sixth, seventh, eighth grade, that's complicated. I mean, that really makes gene therapy seem pretty straightforward because at least I feel like I can predict sort of what the issues are or what the conversation we're even having is um, and without having to, you know, pull all kinds of back channels. That's complicated. So when I go to work, I feel like I just, this is easy street. Yes, um, and so, but anyway, that, that's maybe not the answer that you wanted. I am a pathological optimist in the sense I truly believe at Bluebird, I really haven't had a bad day. Um, but I think there are there are challenges that are going to get you to the game, if you will, that you need to fix. You've got to be able to manufacture virus. You've got to be able to pick the right targets. You've got to be able to do the right trials. And then there are challenges that come with success. Like if you actually can do this, if you actually can cure a genetic disease, and you only treat them one time, the body doesn't pay very well every time it produces protein. And so replacement is great because you have to keep paying to get the protein, but the body, if you're producing in the marrow or in your cells, doesn't pay, right? So what's the challenge there? Have you just done the right thing for patients and done the right thing for the system, but you can't get paid for it? I can come to that in a minute. I have very strong views on that, whether they're right, you know, you guys can judge. But I think ultimately there, uh, the, right, the right thing will prevail. And I think the system will come into alignment as more and more of those types of cures come up. But the challenges on the other side, the, most, the biggest one was manufacturing, right? To try to actually produce enough of this virus that can actually infect your target cell effectively. That's been the biggest one, but that's where we're now very aggressively moving through the scale up. And it's one that I don't think a lot of people have paid attention to. So if you are interested in the gene therapy field, I'd encourage you to be very sort of detail oriented when it comes to whether you're an AAV company or a Lenti company or you're in this space, how do you actually manufacture the virus? How good are you at how scalable is it? Because that's one piece of the equation. The other one that most people don't talk about, maybe they don't realize. What we do is called ex vivo gene therapy. So we gotta take your cells out. Then we gotta put them in a certain place and we gotta then take the virus that we've made somewhere else, stick it onto your cells. And we have to do that in 48 hours. Once we do that and transduce, meaning it does its job, then we can freeze it down and we can breathe for a second. But that process, which is called drug product manufacturing, it's, it's the, the target cell has to meet the virus outside the body. So in our case, we do a transplant, standard apheresis, you know, pull out your cells that we want, we send them to a central location where our virus is, we transduce them as quickly as possible, we test them and we freeze them down. Then you deliver it back to the patient when they're ready and infuse it. But that cold chain, if you will, or supply chain, that's not straightforward. And imagine doing that on a global basis. So any of the companies I've just talked about need to have the infrastructure and the capability to understand all those steps. Because ex vivo lentiviral therapy uh, is the same for whether you're a Novartis trying to work on their oncology product, same thing. You gotta get the cells, you gotta transduce them. It's not just about making the virus. So we've gotten really good at making the virus. We're able to deploy centrally uh, in a regional manner to do this transduction step. And then we ultimately have to think about how you do that globally. But that's something that I think is what keeps me up at night. But again, it's one of these things that only matters if you're successful. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting to the point where some of the data we have, it's scaring us a little bit. And I admit, as much as I love Bluebird and I believe in where we can go, we're gonna need help over time. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think believing you don't need help is a bad thing. Um, although, again, my kids haven't figured that one out yet. But that's the, the, what I'd say, the biggest challenge out there that we've now gotten into. Before, it was just being able to make it and show that the new product is that much better. That clinical data is out there now. So now we just got to deliver on that. The next step is, how do you deploy? And then the next step after that is, how do you commercialize and launch something like this? Yeah, yeah certainly, um, yeah, obviously, assuming clinical success. Biggest um, option. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, uh, 
curious to hear your thoughts on on just the current regulatory environment for ther gene yeah. therapy. We know that you know in the past the, the FDA has is, is, uh, taken some I think extreme measures based on um, you know on, on some safety signals or events, but. Um, but you know, not only where it is now, but where is it going? They've been yeah. a lot more accommodative uh, under, under the new commissioner in a, in a lot of different areas. You, you talk about an antibiotics, oncology, and so forth. Um, but you know, how do you see yep. that playing out? And, and as I understand it, you know, there hasn't been a, a gene therapy product necessarily approved in, in the U.S., uh, but there soon will be. Uh, you know, do you know given, something I don't know? <laughs> Well, just given uh, the, yeah, yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. There's a numbers game here, yep. so. Well, I think there is, the, U, the U.S. and so forth have come a long way, and I can describe that. But I think there's a reason why all our original studies were all done in Paris. I think gene therapy as a field would be even further set back if the Europeans hadn't allowed some of these studies to continue. ALD and thalassemia for us, those are all done out of the Neckhair Institute and, and other institutes in Paris. Why is that? For some reason, and this predates me, they were just more comfortable with that. It didn't shut down despite some of the challenges. But I, what I'm happy to say is, in the last few years, both the U.S. and Europe have been incredibly collaborative on, because we're also operating, remember, on a kind of an orphan risk benefit side that's favorable. So that certainly helps, right? We're not going in for sort of hangnail issues. We're going in for life and death issues, usually over children. So that gets you a nice sort of access point. And we're going in with a curative, potentially curative treatment for something like that. That's led to a very collaborative dialogue. It also, and Bio as an organization, I sit on that board as well, and they have been very instrumental in also certainly supporting and engaging in how do we become more progressive in, a, in addressing that risk benefit to allow the right kind of an approval path and the right time of regulatory flexibility. Europeans are there, the US is there, so uh, the, the Cell and ther Gene Therapy Division of CBER have been tremendous. They've engaged, they've been encouraging, they ask good questions. We are also try to deliver a package that exceeds their expectations every single time. And they're not used to that because a lot of them have been more academic in nature because that's where gene therapy's been. So trying to raise that bar is what we've done, but they have been very collaborative and have never actually asked of anything unreasonable uh, in that regard and been very responsive. So I think that's not just for us, that's gene therapy as a class, but I think it also speaks to the larger trend from a regulatory perspective, which is, I think, trying to make that better decision between risk adjustment and you know, whether it's uh, accelerated approval, breakthrough approval, special medical use, or it's adaptive licensing over in Europe. All those are things that lead me to the conclusion when asked internally or externally about what's our regulatory strategy for ALD or THAL or sickle cell, I say we have none. And the reason we have none is because it's going to be totally data dependent. And we're going to wait to the last minute to create optionality because if we get very positive data, the regulatory strategy will shift overnight. And so I think, so how do you keep all those options open? You're just transparent and you engage with the agency in a respectful manner. And that's what we've, we've done. Um, to my team's credit, they do not let me in the room with the agencies uh, because I'm a little bouncy, in case you haven't noticed. And so I pace outside and I wait and then they come out and they tell me how it goes. But it's, it's, that's not necessary anymore. That was our first couple meetings because it's, been, it's actually been very collaborative and actually informal at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that, the overall environment was one of our biggest worries three years ago. That has far exceeded our mm -hmm. expectations. That does not mean the hurdles come down at all. It just means that we're having what I think is a a data-driven, risk-adjusted conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think um, that's where you want to be with, yeah. with the FDA. Uh, I think, uh, I think having to to fight battles um, f either from those before you uh, that that seem insurmountable in, in some other um, you know areas of development. I think this is not where you want to be. But I think that sounds like you know, it's definitely a healthy, constructive, um, you know, give and take and. Uh, you know, there's promise, uh, but there's promise for a lot of products that are in development, including yeah. yours. But let's let's say um, maybe fast forward a little bit. I think, um, and, and just thinking, you know, I know, you know, the big topic in gene therapy is really, you know, the pricing, reimbursement, dynamic. Um, you know, we all saw and are seeing what what has happened with with Gilead and Sovaldi and um, you know, potentially curing a, a disease and how. Uh, our reimbursement uh, system is really set up, um, or, or maybe not, for uh, you know functional cures. And so, kind of, uh, I think right now, you know, you look at a lot of gene therapy approaches. 
um, you know, they, they take one or two doses and potentially cure a disease. And so, you know, a lot, a lot of people kind of are wondering, what is that, what, what kind of impact will that have on uh, not only companies like yourself, but the overall system environment on an annual basis? That, that's not gonna get them to start to behave differently. However, you start talking about thalassemia, you start talking about sickle cell disease, and Gilead certainly is another uh, great example that's on the other side now. Now you're starting to get into, they have to fix the system, but it's not just them, it's not just the agency, it's not just the payers, it's also, and I preach uh, to anyone who'll listen, um, which isn't that many people, but those who do is responsible pricing. I would hope that when Bluebird comes to the table to ultimately make a helpful call on what we do on pricing, we'll consider a number of these components because it is multifactorial. And what I'd love to be able to see is you get to the other side of, of sort of risk sharing. Because ultimately, asking for everything up front and only working in a certain percentage of the population is not a sustainable model. And we have the benefit, in the case of thalassemia, to make a long technical story short, is when we insert that gene into your DNA, there's a single mutation that allows us with a blood draw every week or every day if you wanted to, to assess exactly how much your hemoglobin comes from the product that we put in. As a result, you have a spectacular in vivo biomarker that correlates with outcome. So we can say on an on a every week basis, every month basis, every year basis, is it still working? And so that's a pretty clear way of saying, hey, listen, we're going to treat, maybe you pay a certain amount up front, and then you pay on an annualized basis as long as it's still working. Now, I know there's lots of complexity in that from a system point of view, et cetera, but my naive, pathologically optimist view on the world says that makes sense. That makes sense for everybody. It makes sense for Bluebird. It makes sense for the patients. It makes sense for the payers. It makes sense for the clinicians. Now it's complicated because think about the tracking. How long should we be able to track these patients who have been cured? Why do they want to come back to the doctor's office? Why do they want? Well, maybe there's a different way to shorten that time frame so you can sort of get your head around that. But I think that is one of the key aspects that I think as an industry, we need to sort of get comfortable with that. You can't get paid all up front and then the system has to have it on the come mm -hmm. for some percent of those patients. Now that is a theoretical position that, that we have to sort out, and it may be different, admittedly, for thalassemia, then for sickle cell, then for ALD, but at the end of the day, it all has to be responsible. Pricing at a level, because you can, is not a sustainable model for the industry. And I'm not suggesting that's what Sivaldi and others did. What I am suggesting is I think a lot of these components have to be taken into account. Size of your population, severity, the ability to save the system uh, dollars, if you will, over the long term. If you consider all those things, then I think there is a, pricing uh, um, that is reasonable. Gene therapy is going to push the envelope yet again because it's one-time treatment. So you can't turn off the valve. Once you've treated, you're done. And so that puts another hurdle on how do you, how do you handle that situation with pricing. And you're right, Unicure in Europe is, is, is and I'm sure is uh, shortly going to face that question, but every disease is different. The LPL need is different than the ALDD need, which is different than thalassemia. As a result, I don't think one model is necessarily gonna be right for all, or one level. <coughs> Last thing, then I'll be quiet and ask you to uh, see if you wanna follow up, is this notion that there's some theoretical threshold on pricing is the wrong way to think about it, right? It's sort of a, a price for return or cost of goods is, is sort of the wrong way to think about it because it, it's a no-win situation because it doesn't take into account a lot of the complexity that companies like us and others have to put forth and it doesn't take into complexity of the uh, sort of the, the value that you're contributing. So you do ultimately have to come back to saying what is the value that your product delivers and then price according to that and if the price is on a one-time basis higher than you would think, okay, then that's different. But that, is that 100,000, is that 500,000, is that a million, is that 10 million? I don't know. Very much depends on the disease and the value contributing. And then if there's a way that everybody shares risk, that's how you can sort of, to me, kind of make the middle ground. So everyone has to trade off, including industry, and not just point fingers. And so, anyway, that's, for lack of better words, my opening volley on the... No, it's just, I mean, your response, it, it's, there's a lot of, not all of, um, uh, I think your statement would apply to kind of how people viewed the orphan uh, pricing reimbursement model, say, 15, 20 years ago. But there are a lot of cor uh, corollaries there. Yeah. And I think one, um, you know, one aspect of that is, I mean, you saw how big pharma uh, slowly, you know, kind of uh, got more and more involved in, in at least the orphan space now. I think many big pharmas have their own orphan um, branches or divisions. <clears throat> but 
But how do you see Big Pharma's involvement here now in the gene therapy space, maybe compared to other precedents? Um, and you know, how do you, where do you see their level of activity going forward? And you know, does it does it make more sense for more Big Pharma to come in, maybe after some of the you know legwork biotech tech, uh, has, not only on the clinical regulatory side, but even some of the pricing yeah. dynamics? Well, I, I'm a I made a joke earlier about growing up in a big pharma family and that's an area I don't necessarily want to work in. But that's a, that's a personal desire to work in smaller companies. But big pharma has a huge role to play because of their resources, because of their capabilities on a global basis for late stage clinical studies as well as commercialization. That is very hard, right? Maybe Gilead can get on the other side of that. But to have that as an aspiration, from, as a vision, I'm not sure it makes sense for a company like Bluebird. As opposed to saying, look, why don't you keep doing what you're good at, Bluebird, to, to take a cutting edge technology and keep pushing the envelope in a very highly innovative way with, as we say inside, we have one committee, we have as few layers as possible, and sort of diversification and the word portfolio, those are all bad words because we don't have a portfolio. We have a couple of products that all need to work. And if they don't work, we're out of business. It's not a, well, we'll work on this one, we'll work on this one, and we'll diversify into this, or we'll get rid of this country or that country. No. So I think that's, we don't have the benefit of that, but I, I think that's what helps drive the fire of innovation. And that's something that just, you can't do in a very, very big com uh, company. And I think they've acknowledged that. So why does a little company like us aspire to be like them? And why does a big company like that aspire to be us in a certain way? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. As opposed to saying, is there a nice natural equilibrium between the two of us where everybody wins? And I think that's where you'll see a lot of the evolution. That's not unique to gene therapy. But I think there are aspects of gene therapy that are going to require big pharma's involvement. Deploying what I just talked about, that drug product infrastructure around the world, that's pretty hard to do in a rapid pace unless you have a little more resources than a company like Bluebird. So I think that that's all positive and you've seen them come in. Novartis is in, right? Biogen is in. And these are well, big biotechs as well as big pharmas. You got Celgene, that certainly is in. GSK is in. So, but they're growing and they're getting comfortable because they're not the early adopters nor should they be. So I think that's a, a natural evolution. It's actually happening a lot faster than I would have predicted uh, personally in gene therapy and, and maybe others as well. But it's, it's putting money into the system and a belief that the horizon is not two years out, but it's 10 years out. And you know, my horizon has been six months, right? And now it's starting to creep towards a year. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's healthy, because uh, a lot of good stuff happens if you keep those equilibriums or those ecosystems vibrant. And um, so I definitely don't poo-poo it. Uh, but at the same time, I guard our innov innovation and the passion and the people that we have very very clearly, and that's where the uh, Celgene deal was great, because they go for it, right? Mm -hmm. That was their view. Mm -hmm. Let us know how it's going, and we'll engage, we'll help, but you guys are, you know, uh, in charge of, of driving that forward. Well, good. I, we want to leave some time for questions, questions. Um, but uh, I, I want to also one out there. Uh, make sure if there are any, please let us know. I'm uh, uh, probably staring at Nick too much uh, during this interview, but um, but one, you know, maybe switching gears a little bit because uh, I think a lot of a lot of those in the audience and, and those that will be watching this replay um, probably are interested to hear your thoughts just on, you know, having gone public recently. Any lessons learned there? Um, and maybe, you know, we're in a special environment. I think everyone recognizes that. But you know, is there? Yeah, there are a couple of things you would have done differently um, or that you're surprised maybe to the upside with uh, yeah. throughout the process and going, going public. Yeah, I heard nightmare stories and I personally had no interest in taking the company public nor did our, our board and, and uh, Jeff Walsh, our, our COO. And then it just became, wait a minute, you look at the math on what the resources are and the dollars that we need over time, you have a couple of choices. Either you start selling your, your products to, to raise that capital, or you can think about selling your equity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that became pretty clear pretty quickly once the environment started to warm up to that and said, well, let, let's go for it because we need those types of resources. But I'd heard nightmare stories about the roadshow and the pricing and all that. So very fortunate in the sense that you know, timing's everything in life, that it went spectacularly well. And I, I don't think it was because it was myself or our team were spectacularly good. I think it helped with the timing. And there were a couple uh, positive things that all happened at once that led us to get out in a very positive trajectory. And I have to say, the experience of being public has been universally positive. And part, maybe it's just because I, I, I don't get too stressed out about certain things, uh, personally, or, or let our team. Um, the, the difference, though, is there's a lot more pressure and there's a lot more influence to do things for the short term. 
And I think if you, if you can withstand both those and say, hey, listen, you take a lot of feedback, you take a lot of questions, but you don't let that lead you into sort of poor immediate decision making. Um, and I can give plenty of examples like that. If you, if you don't let that distract you, then everything else is gravy. We have you know, a lot of one-on-ones and a lot of these types of meetings that some people are going to say, isn't that terrible? It's a waste of your time. I totally disagree. You're sitting with a whole bunch of people that are either MDs, PhDs, or just extremely smart and really good at pattern recognition. And I'm not saying that because some of you may be investors. I'm saying that because the types of questions that you then ask is really helpful for us to say, well, all we care about is our world. I'm not looking at the entire world all the time, whereas these investors are. So that pattern recognition and insights is actually extremely helpful and has definitely influenced our strategy. What it hasn't influenced is, you know, what we're going after and how we behave with the regulatory agency. It hasn't influenced how we communicate what we do. We decided not to do quarterly calls. I still understand what you do a quarterly call for in our type of company. So I asked our lawyer, I said, do we have to do quarterly calls? They go, well, everyone does. I said, well, that wasn't the question. I said, do we have to do legally? Do we have to do a quarterly call? I said, no. So okay, well, let's not do it because we're not a revenue company. We talk to investors all the time. They have access to us all the time. Why do this call that takes the entire team two weeks to prepare? And there's only downside on the call if you screw something up, right? So why do that? And why engage in that? Because it's a distraction to the team. So we constantly try to challenge and say, make sure we're staying focused on the things we need. And I think investors ultimately will respect that. There's a bunch of things we're doing now that I'm sure we could communicate that might bump our stock price or get people more excited, but that doesn't make sense. That's a short-term game. Just think about this over the long term and then have a mature approach, and I think ultimately that gets you more credibility and excitement. So I have to say, in that regard, and the fact that you can raise $120 million in less than 48 hours, I'm come from the venture background, right? That's usually a lot more painful, right? And to get that kind of cash in, and that really helps us be aggressive and do what we need to do without spending all our time, management and others, raising money. So I think that's been uh, incredibly rewarding and positive on that front. I don't think it's right for everybody. I think for us, because it's a product engine and it's a platform and we're getting closer to the market, um, it's been very positive. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly timing timing is everything, right? I mean, if you, if you had gone out a couple years prior, it might have, might have been a different experience. <laughs> yeah, um, I think so. But I, but I think, uh, yeah, my, the message I'm hearing is, you know, um, that there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of data that's presented to you in the process. You need to identify what's important to you, your board, and your current shareholders, and then, um, and then just go for it uh, at the right time. And, and I think that's, um, in hindsight, you know, I think it's, it's probably the best, best approach. I mean, I've been involved with a number of IPOs myself, and I think there are a lot of potential pitfalls along the way, but, um, you know, having the right team and the right you know, professionals, legal, uh, banking around you to just get it done is, yep. is probably the way to do it. So picking the right people look, too. I was look at the, the tiny acquisition we did of a little company called Bergenin in Seattle. It's a genome editing company. It wasn't really a company. It's five or six guys who are really good at, at designing these nucleases that clamp down on your DNA and cut in very specific places. But, you know, we knew, we were reasonably confident that Wall Street, if you will, wasn't necessarily going to get it. We're also reasonably confident that they didn't care in the sense that you do what you need to do for whatever horizon you're looking at, as long as it doesn't influence your ability to drive those near-term value drivers, ALD, thousand, sickle cell, do what you gotta do to build a sustainable company. And I think now all of a sudden people are saying, wait a minute, that's turned out to be fairly important because it ties back to what you're doing. That, that's the, that's the, the approach we'd like to take, is to be willing to take some of those risks. Now that wasn't big money. Um, but it still was, it was important strategically. So I think that's how we view our job. We have to drive the strategic moves and then the near-term data moves and so forth, that's gonna drive the stock price. Yeah, well that's great. Um, I really appreciate you uh, letting me pepper you with questions here. I mean, we'd love to open it up for any, any questions. There's gotta be at least um, one question out there. You know, people have, yes, sir. Thank you. So, um, I guess this is kind of a personal question. You mentioned that you grew up in a, a big farmer environment, and so you've grown up in the industry. Um, but you've taken, you had to take a long view with this, mm -hmm. right? Coming back to gene therapy, yeah. and third rock, and then to sign on to be CEO. Is there another group, venture group, or another company, or a CEO who's been a model or a mentor for you in this? What prepared you to take this long view? 
Um, those are all very nice words. I'm not sure I put myself in the category. I know my kids wouldn't. Uh, but the, you know, I think Mark Levin was, uh, you know, one who I'd worked with very closely at Millennium in the sense that what he instilled personally for me was just a, orthogonal thinking. I'm fairly linear, get the job done. He's very orthogonal, saying talk to people, really just triangulate in on the issues, and then truly believe that the words he's used often is sort of nothing's impossible concept, and go for it. And I think that was, I had no business becoming, I'll admit, this CEO of Bluebird when I did. I didn't have the background or the pedigree. I, I think I'd done some good work at a few different companies. But I also, again, this is where luck and timing, I spent a lot of time with Mark, Bob, and Kevin, who were the founders of Third Rock, and they believed. They said, hey, give it a run. We'll do it in a SIS model because we think you have some of the fundamentals. So I think that was a case where I look back on that is if you can get yourself in a position where you get, you get handed an opportunity, then it's yours to, to deliver on. So I think that was, at least from my personal perspective, Mark Mark and the team at Third Rock, their willingness to take a bet on me uh, was uh, what I think has been the biggest catalyst to the change in my personal career. And then it's up to now you obviously got to go forth and, and execute uh, in, in, a, in a way. Um, so that's been, uh, there are other mentors that are more maybe on the personal side, like the CEO of uh, this company called Agios, uh, David Schenkein. Uh, he, we started the same day at Millennium and he's uh, been a real inspiration because he's been a, uh, a, a cancer doc for a very, very long time. And, the, and the, what he's really taught me not only is on the philanthropic side, but also on the why we do what we do comes down to the patients, comes down to that every single day. And I think that's, that's something that we at Bluebird you know, hold very, very, very dear and because it simplifies everything. Uh, you know, it's very, this market stuff and the, and the valuation stuff, it's, it's all very complicated. What's not very complicated is what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if you focus on that and make your decisions through that lens, that's something that I think David Schenkein has learned having grown up as being a head of a Tufts Cancer Center and seeing people die a lot. Um, that taught me not having had the, well, benefits, the wrong word, but the experience of that. So those are the are two, what I'd say, mentors from my perspective. And last but not least, as you've heard, because I keep mentioning is, I'm very driven from the family side of the equation, that as an anchor and as a rationale uh, and a motivation. Um, I don't want my kids or certainly not my wife thinking of me as a venture capitalist or uh, someone who sort of has been successful in a financial sense as opposed to you look at kids with ALD who now have a, a, a long and sort of fruitful life. That's uh, personally, that's where I'd like to apply my time and skill set. And so um, I'm not sure if that gets to your question, but that's, that gives you a little color maybe. Any other questions? Sure. Has your decision to avoid the quarterlies given rise to a greater impetus to get out there on the IR, PR side and forums such as this in order to assure that people understand who you are, what the team is doing, what the story is about, where you're going? And do you feel any pressure from some of the funds that might uh, have an interest in learning more? Well, I don't think so, because number one, I don't know how many of these calls you've listened in on, right? If you think, you know, for companies like us, you get 20, 30 that show up. None of them want to ask any questions because they don't want to tell the other people what kind of questions they're asking, right? So it, it's sort of like this little game that's kind of funny. And now where, where it will change and where we will evolve, we, where are, we do take a call on an annual basis, not necessarily a quarterly basis, is if you want to provide color and texture in a, in a concise sort of way, as we get further along in that, I think ultimately we'll have to do it. Today, it's the one-on-one -on -one conversations, these types of forums and so forth, is a better way to educate and, and learn Learn. So it, I don't think it's affected it in the sense we've always had a pretty intense get out there and try to communicate not just with me but a number of our players so we have multiple faces and multiple sort of touch points and learning points um, in that regard. But uh, it's actually remarkable how, how smart some of the investors are on predicting where we're going and what we're doing and why we're doing it. So we get out there a decent amount. And this thing with the quarterly calls, it's, it's, um, it, it was more just kind of the to save time and focus myself and others. Uh, and I think at some point though, I'm sure my chief counsel will, will not let me <laughs> push that agenda, but that's probably for the right reasons. If you actually start having people who show up and are relying on those calls for information, um, that's just not where we've seen. We monitor, we look at all our sister companies and we chuckle because they spent the last three weeks getting ready for it and we send out a press release. <laughs> so. All right, any other questions? Thanks for coming, guys. Well, Nick, yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Uh, I think we all really appreciate the insights you shared today, and good Thank luck you in your, uh, you know, endeavors and in the, the quest. Future. So, all right. well.